This module will discuss a variety of different types of special echoes, including the stratiform brightband and a variety of non-meteorological echoes that you may encounter when viewing radar data. We'll discuss various types of anomalous propagation listed at the bottom. First, we'll discuss the stratiform brightband. It is a layer of enhanced reflectivity that occurs as frozen precipitation falls through the zero degree sea level and melts. Consider the weather radar equation that we saw earlier in this lecture series. The power received at an antenna is a function of the properties of the radar, which remain constant, and properties of the target. The power received is then converted to some reflectivity by algebraically maneuvering this equation. The radar processor must assume some dielectric constant k when converting from received power to reflectivity. However, the dielectric constant for water is almost five times that of ice. This means that between the same sized ice and water hydrometeors, the ice would return less power than the water. However, melting ice hydrometeors are often aggregates that are much less dense than liquid water drops, and therefore have larger backscattering cross sections. Since reflectivity is very sensitive to the size, the ice can still return plenty of power despite its lower dielectric constant. The region of melting ice experiences large melting ice hydrometeors that are surrounded by a liquid water shell that maximizes K. The radar sees the increase in return power as an increase in reflectivity. In visual form, consider falling ice hydrometeors above the zero degree sea level that have large Z but small K. As they melt, they initially retain their size, but are surrounded by a shell of liquid water. The dielectric constant is important at this point, that is important at this point, is that of water. But this backscattering cross-section is still large. Eventually the ice completely melts, and we are left with a distribution of denser, completely liquid drops with large K, but smaller backscattering cross-section in, in the melting layer. Thus, locally, between the altitudes just above and below this zero degree sea level, the maximum reflectivity is found where the melting is occurring. As we stated in the lecture on dual pole, this can also manifest itself in the differential reflectivity and copolar correlation coefficient. We'll take another look at some examples of a bright band that occurs in regions of stratiform precipitation where vertical motions are not strong enough to loft large hydrometeors. We'll look at vertical cross sections along the yellow line to the southeast of the radar. PPI cross sections of reflectivity, ZDR, and rho HV are shown. The maximum reflectivity and ZDR are clearly seen at an altitude of around four to five kilometers and are accompanied by minima in the correlation coefficient. In looking at planned views of reflectivity or other fields, the bright band can be seen as a ring of enhanced reflectivity, forming a ring at an approximately equidistant range, assuming the horizontal gradient temperature in the radar domain is small. This example shows a radar bright band for a 5 degree tilt, located about 50 kilometers from the radar site. As we move to a higher elevation angle, we see that ring get closer to the radar because the height of the beam increases more rapidly with range. And with even higher tilts, the bright band appears even closer. Next, we will look through various other types of anomalous propagation. The first we'll look at is beam blockage. This example is taken from imagery in southwestern Alaska. Some terrain is located to the southwest of the radar. Here's the radar on the terrains over here in this particular example. Echo can be detected in this area right here between the radar and the terrain, but in the black ellipse beyond the terrain, a relatively weak echo region is detected. The actual hydrometeors probably are more reflective, but because so much power was dissipated by the terrain, little power from further along the ray remains that can be backscattered to the radar. The processor interprets the reduced power as reduced reflectivity. Radar sites are generally selected such that beam blockage by structures or trees is minimized. However, in mountainous areas, 
Blockage of the beam at low elevation angles is sometimes unavoidable. This can be partially remedied by placing the radar atop small topographical features, but then the radar shoots over any echo that is located only at low altitudes beneath the radar. This is the case with the radar in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is located high up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. A more extreme example of beam blockage is seen here. This radar was located a few hundred meters to the east of a grove of trees that blocked the beam below the 2.5 degree tilt. The plan view shown here illustrates Ill reflectivity at the 0.5 degree tilt. Even though convection is probably present to the west of the radar out here, so much radiation is scattered or absorbed by the trees right next to the radar that the radar indicates no echo out here. Generally speaking, and this will be a common theme throughout the rest of this module, if you encounter strange looking echo features that are oriented lengthwise, a long rays like you see here, you should interpret that data with caution because there's a good chance it's somehow non-meteorological. Ground clutter is often observed close to a radar. Ground clutter is typically characterized by its radial velocity of zero. Clutter is caused by the beam intersecting objects on the ground and the power returned from that backscatter. This can happen as the beam is moving upward away from the radar or as the beam is super refracted back down to the surface and encounters objects on the ground. This example shows a clear example of ground clutter located to the northeast or the north-northeast of the radar, which is located here in this example. And this echo has some moderate reflectivity. In this location, the return will be persistent in clear air because it's a wind farm that's not moving. The echo is just caused by the backscatter off of the wind turbines. Flying birds and insects can also be seen on radar. This example shows rings of reflectivity. Here's one and a few others that are caused by birds leaving lakes in the early morning. If you follow the link shown in this slide here, this link, uh, you'll find several examples of how weather radar can also see emergence of insects, such as mayflies along rivers. In particular, with insects that move with the wind, the radial velocity usually depicts the radial component of the actual flow. A hail spike is an anomalous echo that is observed along a ray. It is also known as three-body scattering and happens in intense thunderstorms in which large hail is present. In this example, suppose the radar is located off the top right of the image somewhere over here and the beam is pointing along the white arrow. The beam will encounter the strong scatterers in the hail core, which is right here and denoted by the very high reflectivity in excess of 65 dBZ. However, for large, irregularly shaped hail, some of the radiation is not immediately scattered back to the radar, but down toward the ground. The radiation then reflects off the ground, back to the hail, and then off the hail back to the radar. Therefore, although much of the radiation is backscattered off the hydrometeors directly to the radar and gives you this very strong echo here, there is some delay for a small amount of the transmitted signal. Since the radar processor determines the range of an echo based on the time delay between transmission and receipt, the processor interprets the delayed power return as reflectivity further along the ray than where the hail core is actually located. Hail spikes such as these, this is the hail spike, are indicative of a severe thunderstorm with particularly large hail. Similarly, a sunrise or sunset spike occurs along a single ray in the direction of the sun when it is near the horizon. In this case, the echo is not reflecting off the sun, of course, but rather the sun is a source of microwave emissions that the radar interprets as return to power. Technically, this is a form of radio frequency interference, in which the radar is detecting radiation from a different source than the signal it transmitted. Side lobes occur because the antenna gain function is not perfectly aligned along the main lobe. Some power transmitted by the radar leaks into directions that are azimuthally displaced from the direction that the antenna points. As a result, a small amount of received power may actually come from somewhere other than the main lobe. 
This mainly occurs when the main lobe is pointing toward a region that is immediately alongside a particularly intense echo. In this example shown here, the main lobe is denoted by these two black lines right here. Uh, one of the side lobes is denoted by the two dashed lines. The main lobe experiences very little backscatter because there's not really any echo here or no hydrometeors here to produce echo. Even though the side lobe contains much less power, as we can tell from the antenna gain functions, the backscattering by the large hydrometeors that are present in this cell causes the backscatter to the radar to be comparable to the backscatter that we get in the main lobe. Does the, but the processor interprets all the power as having come from the main lobe. So even though you're getting some energy from over here in the side lobe, the radar thinks it's all here in the main lobe, and it fills it in like this, such that it thinks that there's echo where there really is not. As a result, some non-existent echo may be depicted in clear air along the edges of particularly intense convection, like in this example, or here at the top of particularly intense convection. That contains large targets. Second trip, or range-folded echo, happens when power is returned from targets located beyond the maximum unambiguous range of the radar. Suppose the maximum unambiguous range, which is controlled by the PRF given a radar with some wavelength, is 100 kilometers. That means the radiation can travel out 100 kilometers and back 100 kilometers to the radar between pulse transmissions. However, radiation that is not scattered will continue to travel beyond the 100 kilometers. Suppose that a tall cloud is present at 150 kilometers and that radiation transmitted by one pulse scatters off the cloud and back to the radar. The problem is that radiation doesn't get back to the radar until after a second pulse has been transmitted. The radar processor then sees the returned echo from the cloud 150 kilometers away as being the return signal of the second pulse. Therefore, the radar processor would think that an echo was located only 50 kilometers from the radar. This type of false echo is called the second trip echo. It can be identified easily using LDR for polarization agile radar, but without LDR, second trip echo is usually obvious by its elongated, non-physical looking echo that extends along one or more adjacent rays. An example of that is shown right here which is this ray-aligned, non-physical-looking echo, which turns out to be second-trip echo. If the unambiguous range of the radar were, say, right here, then the echo might be located somewhere down here, outside of that maximum unambiguous range. Finally, radio frequency interference, or RFI, can often occur at radar frequencies shared by other systems. For example, many communication systems operate in C-band. This reflectivity data shown here is an example of C-band radar collected aboard a ship with the C-band communication system also active. The communication system acted as an additional source of C-band radiation that the radar processor perceived as being a return echo from transmitted radiation. So all, most of the stuff here is just background radiation from some other system that wasn't transmitted by the radar. So there, however, there's plenty of meteorological echo, which you can see here, for example, and up here, that is embedded within the widespread RFI. We can attempt to remove this RFI, such as in this imperfect example, which still shows some RFI here, here, for example, in various locations. However, the convective echo is much easier to pick out after a relatively simple correction is made to remove any signal that does not exceed some threshold set by the background noise.